All right, go ahead and open a Bible to Luke chapter 5 as we look at this story. And last week I told you that uh, the sermons from last week and moving forward are going to be a little bit different. And I didn't have a, a name for it. And so now I came up with one. All right, so that's convenient. All right, it's the heart of the church. And that's really over the coming weeks and months what we are going to be uh, talking about and praying about and learning about from God's Word. And last week I mentioned that really what I want to do is to simply share my pastor's heart with you as we strive to follow Jesus together, as we strive to fulfill the Great Commission together. Um, a verse that I shared with you last week, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul writes, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very hearts and lives as well. And so that's my intention is to share, yes, God's word and the gospel with you, but also to, to share my heart and hopes for this church and this congregation with you and that we would move forward together as we seek to fulfill the great commission. And so I want to start with a quote from C.F.W. Walther. If you don't know who that is, he was the first president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. He's the one that founded the seminary in St. Louis. And in 1879, he said, a Christian and a congregation are plants that have grown from the seed sown by other Christians and congregations. I'll say that again. A Christian and a congregation are plants that have grown from the seed sown by other Christians and congregations. And what he meant was that you and I believe in Jesus, you and I collectively as a church exist and follow Jesus together because somewhere along the way, someone else thought it was really important for you and I to know Jesus, right? Like it didn't just, you didn't just wake up one day out of the blue and go, I'm going to church and I love the Lord, all right? Someone else planted the seed of the gospel into your heart and the Holy Spirit grew it into faith and, and grew it collectively into the church that we are now a part of and that we love. And then Walther went on and he said, therefore, so since that's the reality, right, that, that you and I are here and believe in Jesus because someone else planted the gospel in us, he goes on and he says, therefore, this congregation and every individual Christian is to be a seed from which new Christians and congregations can ever again grow. So his whole point is that someone planted the gospel into your heart, into your life. And the Holy Spirit used them and worked through them so that you and I are now here as believers in Jesus. And what I love about Walter is he says, and now here's your new purpose because of that that you would go and plant more gospel seeds out in the world so that more and more Christians can grow and come to faith in Jesus so that more and more people can know the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. And so that's what I want to talk about today as being part of the heart of the church. Last week we talked about, and I asked you the question of who's your one, and I made you do an activity, and surprise, <laughs> I got another activity this week. You're going to love it. But if you weren't here last week, we had sheets with our new purpose statement, our new mission statement as a congregation. I asked everybody in church if they agreed, and you all raised your hand and said yes. So, you know, I'm just holding you accountable, all right? And this is what we said, that we desire to see those who are far from God connected to the new and eternal life that is found in Jesus. Right? We, we want to be planting gospel seeds so that more and more people come to faith in Jesus. We wanna do that as individuals, we wanna do that together as a church. And so if you weren't here last week, there's extra sheets out in the back for you. You can take one, and I really want you to take one, and you put the name down of someone that you are gonna pray for, who you want them to know the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. And you're going to pray for them by name. And we're doing this together as a church. And if you happen to lose your sheet, let me know, because I'm really getting pretty good at making copies. I only break the copier every once in a while now. So we'll make more. So we can keep praying and seeing more and more people come to Jesus. 
Because that's, by the way, just so you know, that's the whole point, right? You know the last thing Jesus ever said to his church? Go, go and make more Christians. There wasn't anything else on the list. That was it. <laughs> love each other, love people, share the gospel. All right, so it's that simple. So I want you to open a Bible to Luke chapter 5. We look at the story, and yes, before you ask, it is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. On one of those days, so Jesus is, is traveling around and he's teaching and he's talking about the kingdom and he's talking about what it means to follow God. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. So this is everybody in the region is coming to hear Jesus speak and teach. They are all gathering together to see if he will do more miracles. And some come with really good intentions. And then as you read the Gospels, some come with bad intentions to try to get Jesus in trouble. But it doesn't, the point is that there's these huge crowds gathering around Jesus, wanting to hear him speak. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. So their intention is what? I'm going to get my friend to Jesus. That is their whole mission. That is their whole purpose is we want to get this person that we love and care about to Jesus. Right? And last week we asked ourselves and we prayed about our person that we love and that we care about, that we want to see be brought to Jesus, whether it's reconnecting with the church, whether it's reconnecting with Jesus after a time, or it's coming to faith all anew, that each of us in our hearts and in our lives have a person or people that we want to see be brought before Jesus. And this is the same desire and purpose and mission that these men have is, well, he's not going to get there on his own, so we're going to have to do it. So one of the motivations behind them is a love for people, which is one of the two great commandments that Jesus says for his church to practice, right? To love God and to love people. And so their love for their friend motivates them and says, this is our focus, to get this person to Jesus. Now there's another purpose behind it, and it's called faith. Anybody ever been to a church service? <clears throat> I'm really asking a risky question right now. And left feeling guilty? Anybody? Hopefully it wasn't, you know, last week. But... <laughs> Now, sometimes we need that conviction, right? The Holy Spirit works in our lives and says, I need to make some changes. But here, here's the point. Guilt will motivate people for a short time period, right? When I was a little kid, my mother gave me a lesson in this. She gave me a lot of lessons because I was not always paying attention. And we were supposed to help one of her best friends who was a single mother move into a new house. And my mom came in the night before and I was watching cartoons and she goes, are you excited to help Carolyn move? And I go, well, it's not like I have a choice. Which was not the answer <laughs> my mom <clears throat> was looking for. <laughs> And she talked to me very kindly and motherly all about what it means to love our friends and to help them and to use that as our motivation. Now, I didn't get it at that point. I'm, okay, I'm not like, oh, wow, what a great talk, Mom, and I had a change of heart. Like, I totally helped out out of obligation and guilt because I was eight, okay? I was just like, Mom said we're going. I can't really not go, so here we are. But my mom was profoundly right about something else, which is love is a much greater motivator. I could guilt you 
and, and manipulate you and badge you and say, no, like, you need to go tell people about Jesus. But it, it only worked for like a week or two maybe. Because then, the, you know, you stop feeling guilty about it. But what motivated these men wasn't a sense of guilt, but it was a love for their friend. They loved their friend so much, they're like, we want to see his life changed and transformed by Jesus. The other motivation for them was faith in Jesus. Because why else would they bring their friend before Jesus unless they thought what? Jesus could actually do something, right? They had heard all the stories about Jesus healing people and performing miracles, and they said, well, we believe that he could do that for our friend too, and so because we love our friend and we believe that Jesus can change their life, guess what? They had a whole new mission and purpose in life, which was we want to see him be brought to Jesus. And it's the same for, for you and I, that we have family and we have friends, we have people in our lives that the Holy Spirit places a burden on our hearts for, that we love and care about, and that we want them to see and believe in Jesus, right? And so we want to be the kind of people in the church that welcomes those people, that seeks and pursues those who are far from God so that they can hear about the grace and mercy and the love of Jesus. But we also have to be motivated by faith that believes that Jesus can actually still change lives. That we don't relegate the, the power of Jesus to just the New Testament and say, oh, he did it back then, but that was back then. But that we would be people that believe, no, no Jesus is still alive, right? Raise your hand if you believe that Jesus is risen from the dead and he's still alive. That's the whole point of our faith, right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that's, that's it. If Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, there's no point in being a Christian. So the foundation of our faith is that we believe Christ has risen from the dead, that Jesus is still alive. So if Jesus is still alive, guess what he's still able to do? Miracles. He's still able to, to change and transform people's lives. He's still able to save those who are lost. And so what we see is this example in these men is there is this love for their friend. And there's also a belief in Jesus that says, we, we love our friend so much. We want Jesus to change his life. And we believe that Jesus can actually do it. So they do this in verse 19, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. So, they encounter an obstacle, right? Because here's the deal. Not every time you have a spiritual conversation or talk with someone about Jesus, are they going to turn around and go, thank you. Sometimes they will. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will be working through those conversations and through those words to draw them closer to Jesus. And sometimes people won't want to hear about it, right? There will be obstacles that get in our way as individuals and as a church. But what I love about this story is they don't care, right? They don't care. There's a crowd, you can't get in. Oh, well, well, we'll get in. It just won't be through the front door. Because why? What are they motivated by? This love for their friend and this belief that Jesus can change his life and heal him. And so with that mentality, their, their attitude is basically, there's nothing that's going to stop us from making this happen. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Because it's one thing, we, sometimes we read Bible stories and go, oh, that's, that's precious, that's neat. They are all gathered together in a worship service, listening to Jesus teach. And it's a, it's a huge crowd, right? People have come from all over the country to hear him talk and teach and preach. 
And in the middle of that, with all these things going on, with all these important people gathered around Jesus, some dude starts sawing a hole in the roof of the sanctuary and go, we'd like you to meet our friend, Bob. And we go, wow, that's a neat story. It's also ridiculous, isn't it? It's also important. Because how many times do we just say no for somebody else? How many times do we say no on behalf of Jesus because there's an obstacle in the way and we go, eh, never mind, it's too hard. It's too crowded, never mind. And they're like, no, we love our friends so much and we know what Jesus can do for them. So if it takes cutting a hole in the roof of the church to get this person to Jesus, guess what they're going to do? Cut a hole in the roof of the church. Because when they are motivated, when you and I are motivated by a love for people who are far from God, and we are motivated by a belief that Jesus is alive and can still save people and change their lives, obstacles become nothing. They don't mean anything to us. We just go, yeah, okay, that's it. fine. We'll do something else. We'll just try another way. We'll just keep going. We'll just keep praying. We'll just keep sharing. We'll just keep talking. We'll just keep loving. Rather than being people that say no or just give up. Now, here's the... We're going to get to the hard part where I make you do stuff. Cutting a hole in the roof of the church building... And I'm, right now, just look up for a moment, this one right here, is actually not that hard to do. I'm not a handyman at all, but I could get on the roof. I did it when I was a kid. I'm really experienced at this, I'm getting on roofs. And I got a saw. I promise you, by next week, I could cut a hole in this roof. I'm just going to leave it at that to make you nervous until next Sunday. But I want you to think about it for a moment. I'm not going to do it. Okay, just take a breath. Some of you are looking real nervous. I'm like, no, no more properties projects, okay? I'm not cutting a hole in the roof. But I want you to think about it for a moment. Would it, is it really that hard? Right? It's not. You just get a saw, get up there with a ladder and, and make some mess. Just make a hole. Here's where it gets hard. The reality is that most of the obstacles that we face are in our hearts. They have nothing to do with cutting a hole in a roof, getting a new sign, buying something, whatever. The reality is most of the obstacles that get in our way of being like these men who love someone so much and believe in Jesus so much they said, we'll do whatever it takes to get them to Jesus. Come from our own hearts. We have obstacles in our hearts. The theological term is we have idols in our hearts. Things we aren't willing to let go, things we are afraid of, that we say, I will bring people to Jesus as long as that doesn't have to change. I'm all for the Great Commission, Pastor, as long as I don't have to do this, or say that, or change this about myself or the church. The reality is, man, we could cut a hole. We could cut a lot of holes. This is a big roof. But we, what we have to do to actually become the disciples in the church that Jesus calls us to be, to follow the example of these men, is we gotta get rid of the obstacles in our own hearts. Um, been through a lot of church interviews for pastoral calls in my lifetime. Some of them were at seminary and then afterwards. And you get asked all kinds of questions. And then over time, because I got tired of being asked questions and I like to mess with people, I started asking my own questions back at call committees just to mess with them and also to see what they would say. 
And then I came up with two really good questions. I thought these were awesome questions that I began asking every single call committee, church committee that ever interviewed me about any role. I don't know if they were actually good. I still think they're good. But it made a lot of church committees not call me back. (laughs) One of the reasons I took the call here is because I asked our call committee these questions. And you called me back. That was nice. But you remembered the questions and actually said, oh, we talked about them and prayed about them. So I'm going to ask the whole congregation these questions. These are questions that I also ask myself. And I ask myself them because I also have obstacles in my heart. Right? Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I get it right all the time. I have idols and fears too. So here are the two questions. There's probably somewhere in your bulletin and you can write these down. I really want you to write them down. All right? <clears throat> So take your time. You can put it on your phone. That's easier for you. Gosh. All right. So here's the first question that I'm going to ask you. What are you willing to do to fulfill the Great Commission? Now, I don't want you to write answers down right now. These are questions that, these are heart questions. I want us to reflect and pray about as we move forward. So what are you willing to do to fulfill the Great Commission? Now here's the the harder of the two questions, at least for me. What are you not willing to do to fulfill the Great Commission? Because I know my own heart. If I'm in a church service, I'm in a Bible class, I'm at a, I'm at a pastor's conference or some kind of church conference. I, mean, I could be totally sold out for Jesus, right? Oh yeah, the, the answer to the first question is of course what? Anything, pastor. We would do anything to fulfill the great, com- we would do anything to get our friend that we love to Jesus. Now we all know in our heads that that's the right answer, right? And this is why I have to constantly ask myself the second question. I don't like the second question. But I have to be honest with my own heart and my own obstacles, my own idols. What am I actually not willing to do to fulfill the Great Commission? What changes am I unwilling to make What attitude shifts am I unwilling to have? What what activities, what conversations am I unwilling to do or to have in order to fulfill the Great Commission? These are, this is a tough question because it requires of us to actually be honest, to confess before the Lord, I have obstacles, I have idols, <laughs> tell, tell Jesus, I, I, like, I want people to know you, but I'm not, I'm not like these men yet. I want to be, but I'm not there yet. Now here's how I see it play out. Every single church I've ever been in, my whole life, whether as a member growing up or as a pastor, I have either witnessed and seen the conversations happen or then when I became a pastor, have had the conversations happen where people will say, well, if the church starts doing this or if the church changes this, I will leave. I won't be a part of it anymore. And what that reveals is our heart, a heart that has some limitations on the Great Commission. I would love to see these people know Jesus. I would love for my one person or my dozen people to know the Lord. Only as long as, I don't have to do fill in the blank. Only as long as the church doesn't change this personal preference that I love too much. Right? 
Sawing a hole in the roof is a pretty simple obstacle. The real obstacles that we have to face and confess and get rid of are the ones that we hold in our heart, are the ones that where we start to put limitations on what we would be willing to do to see people saved by Jesus. Now, I know if I asked you, and I just came up to you after service or individually and just said, hey, would you like to see this person saved? I know you, and I would get 100% yes, I want to. So here's the challenging question for myself that I, I have to wrestle with the Holy Spirit on my own, and I want you to wrestle with and pray about is, okay, what am I willing to do to see that happen? Because I asked you at the very beginning, what's the whole point of church? And you all agreed. It's what? Seeing people saved by Jesus, right? We have people that we love in our lives that we want to see, believe, and know Jesus and his love and forgiveness. You all raised your hand and said, well, we believe that Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. He still changes lives. See, what I want us to be is a church that is okay with sawing a hole in the roof, and I literally mean that. I might do it. You can't stop me. I want us to be a church that's willing to saw a hole in the roof and say, hey, if a sunlight is what it takes to get someone to Jesus, we're going to do it. To be a church that says, we're going to get rid of whatever obstacles are in our way, whatever obstacles and idols are in our heart, because all that matters is the people that we love, the people that are far from God, coming to Jesus and receiving his transformation and his power and his salvation and his forgiveness. And so this is what happens in the story. Verse 20, when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who could forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Now, here's something profound about this story. The men want to bring their friend to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus can heal him and he'll walk again. What does Jesus actually give to the man? Yeah, he heals him eventually, but he gives him something else. He gives him what? Forgiveness of his sins and salvation. So one of the great motivators for us doing this and being this kind of church is knowing, well, Jesus can change lives. He can save people. He can forgive sins. This is what he does. That's why we call him Savior. It's who he is. Sometimes the obstacle is that we say no for somebody before ever asking. Right? We go, ah, they're too far gone. Oh, they, they don't want to hear it or they're not gonna respond well, so I'll just be quiet. What I love about this story is they're like, we're gonna bring him to Jesus and he's gonna heal him and that's gonna be cool. And then Jesus is like, I'm gonna give you way more than you asked for. I'm not just gonna heal him physically, I'm gonna heal him spiritually. In Ephesians chapter three, verse 20 and 21, Apostle Paul shares my favorite prayer of the Bible. He says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or imagine according to the power at work within us. He's describing who God is and he's saying, our Jesus is able to do more than you ask or imagine. So sometimes we struggle with sharing the gospel, planting gospel seeds like Walter said, inviting people to worship, sharing a word of faith with them because the devil convinces us that it won't make a difference. It won't change anything. 
Yet, the Bible says, the God you are praying to for them, the Jesus you are bringing them to, is able to do more than you could ever ask or imagine. Some of you are like, but I've got big prayer requests. <laughs> I, I've got big problems. There's huge obstacles here. And God's word of promise to you is, yeah, but Jesus can do more than you could ever imagine him doing. These guys brought their friend to Jesus and their imagination said he could possibly physically heal him. And Jesus' response was, I can do way more than that. I can save his soul and forgive his sins. And so this is what happens. And the people respond and they worship and they glorify God. So here's what I want uh, to do for a few moments here in worship to make you a little uncomfortable. You're welcome. I want you to think about those questions. I want you to think about whatever obstacles or idols that are in your heart. We're just going to take a time of silent reflection and confession. What we just told you is like, Lord, I need you to remove this idol from my heart. I need you to remove this obstacle from me. And I need you to, Holy Spirit, give me faith and courage where I need it so that we can be people that we're bringing anybody we possibly can to Jesus. So we're going to take a few moments here to pray that way. The good news for you and I is that Jesus doesn't just forgive this man's sin, he forgives our sins, he forgives us when we trip and stumble over those obstacles and those hurdles that we put up. He forgives us when we have too many idols and we confess them, he says, no, I still forgive you. One of the things that I love about Jesus is that he gives us the perfect example of doing whatever it takes to see people saved. In Mark 14, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and he's talking to the Father and he's weeping because he knows the cross is coming, the cross that will save us and forgive us. And yet Jesus says this, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. So even Jesus tells us everything is possible with God. Your friend being saved, your friend coming to faith in Jesus, your family member loving the Lord and returning to Jesus is possible with God. He says, not everything is possible with the Father. And then Jesus goes on though, he says, but remove this cup from me, not what I will, but what you will. And the cup is a picture of God's wrath and punishment for all the sins of the world being poured out on Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I know that that's what's gonna happen on the cross, that the way to save you and me, to save the whole world, is to go to the cross. And yet Jesus is saying, I want them to be saved. He said that's why he came to earth, to seek and save the lost. But there's this giant obstacle in the way, and it's called drinking the cup of God's wrath. And yet Jesus, out of love for the Father and the belief that the Father, all things are possible. And out of love for people, out of love for you and me, he says, but if that's what it takes, Lord, if drinking that cup and taking your wrath and going to the cross is what it takes to bring them forgiveness and salvation, then that's what I'm gonna do. And the good news for you and me is that that's exactly what Jesus does. He says, whatever it takes, 
so they will be saved and forgiven and know the love of the Father, that they will be able to be brought home to you, Lord, is what he will do. And it's also what he does for us. And then in 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul tells us, here is the will of God. Everybody always asks the pastor, what's God's will? The Bible tells you. It says, this is good and is pleasing the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved. So what's God's will is he wants people to be saved and redeemed by Jesus. And Jesus, through the Great Commission and through the power of the Holy Spirit, calls you and I as his followers, as his disciples, and as his church together to say, that's, that's our goal, that's our desire too. And that we would be a church that would say, we're, we're gonna do whatever it takes, whatever attitude changes we need, whatever physical changes we need, whatever changes, whatever it takes, whatever obstacles are in the way, we're gonna tear them all down and say, as long as people get to know Jesus and his salvation and his forgiveness and his love, then it becomes worth it for us. I want to end with a Walther quote. I started with one, now I'm going to end with one. It seemed logical to me. When he was speaking in 1872 to the Synodical Conference, so just imagine a really big voters meeting. And by the way, they had disagreements back then. So, yeah. He was dealing with Christians disagreeing on what the church should do. And this is what he said. For what would happen if we really would make the saving of souls the ultimate purpose, the end and aim of our joint work together? What would happen if we really would make the saving of souls the ultimate purpose, the end and aim of our joint work? I love this question. Think about us together as our Savior Lutheran Church. What would our church look like? How would it behave? How would we worship? What would happen if we really said together, and we agreed together and said, this is our purpose. This is our motivation. Everything is tied up in saying, we love people so much that we want to see those who are far from God knowing the love of Jesus. And we believe in Jesus so much that we believe really, truly, all things are possible with him and that he is alive and still saving people and still doing miracles. What would happen if we said, yeah, that's what we're about. And that's what we're all about. And Walter goes on, and he says this, which course is best for the salvation of souls? I don't know if you've ever been to a voters meeting where people disagreed on something. I have, I don't know about you. And he says, which course is best for the salvation of souls? Will quickly give the right solution. Whatever will win the most souls for Christ, that would decide between us. So my hope and prayer for our Savior, for you and me as a church together, is that we would actually be willing to cut a hole in the roof. Would it be worth it if someone said, I believe in Jesus now? I'm actually asking you that. Because I know a lot of you love this building. It's a beautiful building. But I love Walter's question. What would really happen to our hearts and to our church if we said, that's it, that's all we care about. We would say every single time, well, this person believes in Jesus now, so it was absolutely worth it. I had to give up some personal preferences. I had to allow some changes to happen. But at the end of the day, someone knowing the love of Jesus is more important than that. So that really is my prayer this week for our church, (laughs) because I just want to keep you all guessing. Is he really going to do it? It would be a church that said, yeah, if that's what it took, cutting a hole in the roof, we would absolutely do it to see someone come to faith in Jesus. 
and that we would cheer and clap like the angels in heaven and rejoice and say, yeah, another person knows the love of Jesus. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you went all the way to the cross, that you knew what was necessary for our salvation, and yet you said no obstacle would get in your way, and that for our salvation and salvation of the whole world, you did indeed go all the way to the cross and drink that cup of wrath. Lord, may we follow the example of these men that loved their friend so much, they said we will do whatever it takes to bring them to Jesus. And Holy Spirit, may you give us the same faith and boldness and courage that says we do this because we believe that Jesus is still alive and still saving people and still doing miracles. In your name we pray, amen.